Does everyone have an outline? No? Dante, can you get an outline? Apparently there's an outline up here. Everybody else have an outline? Okay. Second Timothy, chapter 2 tonight, verse 14 and 15. Now 15 I know is a whopper, but we will definitely dig into it a little bit tonight. We'll probably overlap next week as well. We're picking up here in verse 14, where the whole chapter, of course, has this theme of faithful workmanship. And the first chapter dealt with the testimony and appealing to Timothy to be faithful to the testimony of the Lord and of him, Paul, his prisoner, and to be partake of the affliction. So we dealt a lot with chapter 1 with the actual message that put Paul in prison and uh, how that was given to him of the Lord and uh, who forsook him and who didn't forsake him, those in Asia and, and elsewhere. And so chapter 2 then focuses on how Timothy needs to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and to be faithful. He says to commit in verse 2 to faithful men. You shall be able to teach others also. Well, to do that, you've got to be one to know what faithfulness is. And then for the next four verses, it, it describes these examples of faithfulness and what that looks like with these different characters, whether it be the, the uh, warrior or the soldier there or the husbandman. And then uh, Paul uses himself as an example of a faithful servant. We start talking about me and I and my gospel and, and consider what I say. And remember, it was my gospel that, that uh, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by. And I suffer trouble in verse 9, and I endure all things in verse 10. And so he's this example of a faithful servant, even unto bonds, even though the word of God's not bound. And then we covered last week, verses uh, 11 through 13, which is a faithful saying, Paul says, which concerns the glory of Christ and uh, his faithfulness. And so if we be dead with him, we shall live with him. That's according to his faithfulness. If we uh, suffer, then we shall reign with him. That's according to his faithfulness. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And of course, it's part of that faithful saying. We covered that last week. And that's him being faithful as the faithful judge. And then at the end there, if we believe not yet, he abides faithful, which is the point of this faithful saying. He cannot die, deny himself. Uh, so those three verses ended with the faithfulness of Christ. And even if we falter, he's faithful. And so that is the comfort uh, for when the faithful workman suffers and endures, uh, is that Christ is the source of faithfulness, right? And he is the, the, our strength in that regard. So that's where we, we left it. Verse 14 then, he picks up and says, Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they are, uh, strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And then study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And wow, how popular verse 15 is. And how forgotten verse 14 is, it seems like. People skip right over it for the bookmark of verse 15. And I don't want to do that. Part of studying the Bible verse by verse is studying it in context. We've done a lot of lessons on how to rightly divide the word of truth and drawn charts uh, exemplifying how to rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, but in the context, we've done a few, but that's what we're doing tonight in context. So we had to pick up verse 14, and you'll see here the important connection between verse 14 and 15. There's actually 14 and 15 go together. You can't really understand verse 15 in context without verse 14. And so that's what I want to emphasize tonight. So verse 14, he says, of these things, the question might be, well, what things is he talking about? Well, in the greater context of chapter 2, it's faithful men, faithful servants, faithful saying, faithfulness, it's faithful workmanship is the things. But most specifically, the last thing he said is, that, is about Christ's faithfulness and uh, how he cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance. Who is it that he's telling him to put in remembrance? Well, again, the context, he's talking about committing to faithful men. And he's talking about faithful servants. Remember in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he gives a similar exhortation. He says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So he's telling Timothy to exhort, to remind the brethren about right doctrine. And if you do that, you're a good minister. Warn them about the wrong doctrine. If you do that, you're a good minister. And so again here in 2 Timothy, he says, of these things, put them in remembrance. Teach them to be faithful. Commit to faithful men. Make sure they're faithful so they may be able to teach others also to be faithful. Right? This is this idea. 2 Timothy 2.8, for you call before, he says, remember again that Jesus Christ at the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Remind them of these things. I'm not in prison over some personal spat with people. 
It's like Jesus Christ gave me the message that I'm preaching, and that's why I suffered, that's why I endure. Remind these people of these things. That's what faithfulness looks like. So put them in remembrance, is what he says. Then he says, charging them before the Lord. Charge, again, sounds very similar to something Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. Paul gives Timothy a lot of charge. And in 1 Timothy 1, 3, Paul says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. To charge somebody is not simply to suggest, I have an idea, maybe you can do this, please consider. You know, it's not even a beseeching. Paul says that a lot, I beseech thee, I beseech. Uh, a charge is an authoritative instruction, a command, right? It's, this is what you will do, commit it. We talked about committing to faithful men in, in verse 2, right? This is similar to this charge. He's charging Timothy. And in 1 Timothy 1, 3, I charge you, or that thou mightest charge some others, that they teach no other doctrine. Don't just suggest or remind, but he says charge them. This is the authoritative of uh, instruction. They, they will not teach any other doctrine, right? That is the command. That's the instruction. And so this is what Paul's saying. First Timothy 2, verse 4 he says, God will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. This is our charge as ministers, as members of the body of Christ. This is the will of God. And if it's his will and we're faithful, wouldn't we then want to see his will carried out? And that's the whole point of this. So put them in remembrance, brethren. Put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord is what Paul is saying here. Give them authority. Now, he says before the Lord, which is not to be skipped over, because he could give them a personal charge, bring the parchments or something like that, you know. Uh, but this is a charge that the Lord has given him to give to the church, to give to others. And so he says, charge them before the Lord about these things that I just said about faithfulness, about Christ's faithfulness, about suffering things and, and living with Christ and reigning with Christ and, and the judgment of Christ and, and uh, his faithfulness, even when we, we can't, his comfort. So before the Lord, well, this speaks to this charge, the authority of the charge coming from the Lord. Paul will often say, especially to the Corinthians, in the sight of God. I do this or that in the sight of God. We do this in the, in the sight of the Lord. And that's because that's how we should operate. Not as if God can't see what we're doing or doesn't know what we're doing, but rather uh, constrained by his love, living his life that he's given to us in the sight of him. We do it for others for the sake of other, uh, other people's salvation and their edification in the sight of God. And uh, this is what he tells the Corinthians. He rebukes them because they think that by the fact that he's so uh, compassionate towards other people that he's simply trying to please people. And he rebukes them saying, no, I am uh, manifest to God, though I do things for you. And so th that, that's that, that rebuke. But, so he says here again, charge them before the Lord. The Lord is the one who saved them, of course. He's the one that called them. And uh, he's the one, in verse 4, it says that you may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. He's the one that, in Christ, makes us that elect in him, right? So, this is before the Lord. Now, the charge, what the specific nature of the charge is this, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now, this is going to be important to understand what this means. We'll, so we'll deal with some time here about the words to no profit. But the simple charge is strive not to no profit of these hearers, right? The hearers are important, which means these people are communicating, preaching, teaching, committing something to people. And he says the way you do that in faithfulness is to strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. The hearers don't need to be subverted. They need to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth, not subverted. Right? They need to be uh, hearing no other doctrine from you, but that which you've heard from me, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. Right? So strive not about words to no profit. The goal is then people's establishment, their salvation and establishment in Christ. That's God's will. Right? It's Christ in you. That's the goal of faithful workmanship. Not Christ just in me and, and, and you individually, but Christ in others is the point. That's the goal of faith workmanship, Christ in others, uh, which, of course, is the mystery. Right? If you don't know the mystery, you don't know what God's doing, you don't know his will, you can't be a faithful workman, and you can't speak words to profit anybody. Right? This is what we're dealing with here. So the charge is literally strive not uh, about words to no profit, but the subversion of the hearers. Now, I want to deal with these words here. 
Because what happens in verse 14, and we'll see it again in verse 15, is that the meaning of the verse is changed by different translations. In verse 14, strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. The Amplified says, charge them in the presence of God to avoid petty controversy over words, which does no good. Okay. The CSB says, uh, charge them before God not to fight about words, period. This is useless and leads to the ruin. The ESV says, charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, really ruins the hearers. The New American Standard says, in the presence of God, not to dispute about words, which is useless, and leads to the ruin of, of the listeners. The NIV, warn against quarreling about words, it is of no value. The common theme here, don't argue over words. Don't fight over words. W words aren't the things we're supposed to fight over. That's what they say. Right? Because it's the striving about words that is useless. It's the striving about words that has no profit. It's the striving about words which they say uh, is not profitable. Right? The King James says, strive not about words to no profit. The difference is, don't strive about words that are unprofitable, that don't profit. Which is to say that words matter. Yeah. Right? So the verse could say, don't argue about words. Or it could say, don't argue about words that are unprofitable. Don't argue about unprofitable words. So that, that, that makes you then need to be able to discern right and wrong words. Amen. Profitable and unprofitable. Whereas verse 15 will conclude <laughs> rightly dividing the word. You see, that's the context of verse 15. It's in contrast to the charge, the faithful charge here, to strive not about words no profit. Instead, study and rightly divide the word. That's the comparison, okay? If you forget verse 14, you don't know why he's saying in verse 15. It's just some command to study. The opposite of verse 15 is striving about words to no profit, subverting hearers, okay? So what about words? You know, we know it's not just don't fight over words, don't strive over words. In the very context of chapter 2, Paul has told us to strive, hasn't he? In ver up, back up in verse uh, 5, if a man also strive for masteries, is he not crowned? Now, surely there's a difference in striving between just debating and quarreling and arguing and fighting and striving like to gain something. Surely that's different. But still, we are to strive for the gospel in Philippians 1, 27. Strive for the faith of the gospel, which requires words. Yeah. So striving about words, like making sure the words are right and pure and clear and not corrupt, that is something Paul admonishes to do. He tells us to do that. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 13, didn't he tell Timothy to hold fast the form of sound words? So what if the words aren't sound? Well, don't fight over it, is what the NIV would say. Don't quarrel over words. That's unprofitable. We're supposed to hold fast the form of sound words. It was words that was delivered to Paul. It was words that, that make up the gospel. It's words that make up this book. Like, this, this is the word of truth. If the words don't matter, we're just striving about words. You see how the translation changes the meaning there. Well, you're just, this, this next week's lesson uh, we'll be teaching about uh, the differences in Bible versions, and words matter in the differences. But if we're not to strive about words, then maybe they don't. You see, it has ramifications for how we treat the words of God. So words do matter. I told you other translations introduce error by altering this, to say striving about words is no, not profitable. Rather, striving about words to no profit is a subversion of the hearers. We've covered before also in chapter 2 here that words matter throughout the chapter. In verse 2, Paul says, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou the faithful men. So if Timothy is committing to faithful men things that he's heard, words matter, don't they? You hear words. Um, down in verse 7, Consider what I say. And the Lord give the understanding. What do you say if not words? Words matter in verse 7. What well, does it matter who says them or what the words are? They sure do. You get understanding by the, from the Lord by what Paul says in verse 7. Okay, verse 9, I suffer trouble as an evildoer even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Well, apparently, some words can get you bound up and other words cannot, and the word of God is not bound. It's important about the words there. Verse 11, it's a faithful saying. If we be dead with him, we shall also uh, live with him. The faithful saying there. Those words matter. We said last week, you can't change these words and make, still make it a faithful saying. You have to leave those words alone. You can't reverse it. You can't flip it around. That's a faithful saying. You can't say the opposite. Verse 15, rightly dividing the word of truth, which you know. 
that word is important. If you have nothing to rightly divide, then what does it matter? Verse 16 through 17, shun profane and vain babblings. Those are words. Verse 17, their word will eat us death a canker. It sounds like Paul's making much of words in verse 17. Verse 18, concerning the truth have erred. Paul, don't argue about words. That's what the other Bible versions say. That's not what he said in verse 14. He didn't say don't argue about words. He says strive not about words to no profit. Right? That's a difference. It's not striving that is not profitable. It's striving about words to no profit that subverts hearers. Are you with me here? So you see the big change there in the translation that really does matter. So what Paul is saying is not that words don't matter. He's saying which words matter. He's already said words matter. Now he's pointing out which words matter. Charge them that which words is important. Now again, you see here a little bit of foundation for verse 15. What's rightly dividing mean? It's going to mean which words matter. And that's what verse 14 says. But if 14 doesn't say that, other translations, then verse 15 doesn't have to say what it says either. We'll see in a little bit, they change verse 15 too. They go together. Okay. So which words matter? Do the words profit and edify, or do the words subvert, hinder, destroy, obstruct? Right? Because it's not simply, if you speak words, that helps, and if you don't speak words at all, that hurts. Well, that, that can't hurt not to speak your words. Sometimes you can speak words that hurt. Just because you're speaking something doesn't mean it's going to help. Right? So make sure the words you're speaking, you're teaching, communicating, committing, preaching, is, are words that profit, not words that do not profit. Well, how do I know that? That's a good question. Verse 15 will talk about that. But first I want to cover what that word subvert means. Because this, this is also a word changed uh, in the, the translation of other, other, other Bibles. Um, instead of saying subvert, it says it only ruins the hearers. It uh, ruins those who listen. It leads to ruin. Leads to ruin. Um, sometimes, even though meanings may be similar in different translations, people tend to overlook the places in the King James Bible where it's not simply the meaning of the word, but the specific word chosen fits with other verses. It helps you with cross-references. And we'll see again in verse 15 here, this word subvert is, is spoken in contrast in verse 15. So it's a good word to use. The word subvert means to overthrow, to overturn. Yes, it means to ruin. But other versions say to ruin it. Well, subvert means that too, but subvert also means overthrow, to overturn, to corrupt, to pervert. In the word subvert, you see the word sub, like submarine, like it's not on top of the water, it's under the water, right? And vert, like where we get the word vertical, right? Or to turn something. So it's turning something upside down. That's what's happening. When you subvert, you're flipping it over. If you flip over a boat, it's not working, right? You subverted it. A boat needs to go one way. You subvert it, it's sunk. And this is the idea. And Paul uses this idea, overthrow and overturn and corrupt and pervert throughout his epistles, speaking about words. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 2, 17. Paul says, We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, as of, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Now, it should not be a shock then that this verse is also changed in some other Bibles. Or it says, peddle the word of God. We don't peddle the word of God. Well, that's a thing, but it's different than corrupt the word of God. And corrupting the word of God is what Paul's talking about in 2 Timothy 2.14. Right? He's talking about words to no profit, subverting the hearers. You're corrupting hearers by words that aren't profitable. Okay? And so we see corrupt words being spoken in 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2. Now, what's interesting about this is that these corrupt words that people say are the words of God or are the words of truth are not the words of truth or are altered words of truth or are words of truth from a different dispensation uh, are hurting people. And this was in the first century. Okay? People assume that if we get original manuscripts or, or, or closer to the originals, that the manuscripts will be more pure. And this is a false assumption. Okay? Uh, no one has the original autographs uh, of the Bible. But just because you're within, I don't know, 50 years, 20 years, 10 years of the original epistle does not mean you have a pure manuscript. Does not mean you have the pure word of God. In Paul's lifetime, he said there were people corrupting the word of God. So how do you know if it's true or not? Well, that's, a, that's the valid question in, in manuscript evidence. But Second is 4, verse 2, look what Paul says. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty and not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. 
as if there are people doing that? Yeah, there are. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You see that, that language there again? In the sight of God. Charge them before the Lord. Strive not about words to no profit. Right? He, apparently Paul cares a lot about the words of God being pure, not corrupt, not perverted, not mishandled. Right? He says this quite often. It was 4 verse 2. Galatians 1 7. The whole epistle of the Galatians was written because this was, not, was happening. People were striving about words to no profit. This wasn't like a future warning, be careful, this thing might happen. He wasn't even warning about this happening among pagan religions. Like, be careful, there's Hindus and Buddhists out there. Right? There wasn't Mormons yet, there weren't Muslims yet. It wasn't, it wasn't pagan religions he was warning about here. He was talking about those who would come preaching Christ or Jesus or a gospel. In Galatians 1 verse 7, 6, 6 he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that it called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So he mentions the grace of Christ, which is what he preached to them. And there's others that have called them to another gospel, which is not another, which is to say they're preaching Christ. But there'll be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Okay, it's not perverting the gospel of Christ to say, well, I'm Buddhist. That's just like denying the gospel of Christ. Perverting is like, I'm preaching Jesus too, and they're really not. Right, that's perverting the gospel of Christ, corrupting it. Right, you make a cake, and you spit on it. You just corrupted the thing. It's still a cake, though. And you argue about whether it's clean or not, right? That's what Paul's saying in Galatians 1, verse 7. We're still preaching Jesus. we still got the gospel. What was the Galatians' problem, by the way? What was this perversion? They thought the law did something for their position, their edification, their keeping their salvation. The law was essentially these Galatians. They'd been perverted. The gospel of grace is you're not under the law. The law can't help you. It can only condemn you. It can show you your sin. That's about it. We're not under a schoolmaster, he'll say in Galatians 3. So the perversion had to do with, well, if you love Jesus, you'll do his commandments. Keep the law. Jesus taught that. Jesus said do the law. That's in the Bible even. And Paul's saying that's a perversion of his gospel. So this is interesting. We have a book, which is God's word of truth, and we need to strive not about words to no profit. We need to strive about words that do profit. Okay. So Galatians 1, 7 is a perversion. Galatians 5, verse 1 and 2. After four chapters explaining liberty and grace and law and back and forth, Paul says, Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Liberty. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Speaking about the law, which is spoken of in the Bible and by Christ in Matthew, Luke, and John. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, which is something the Bible commanded, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, if you're being taught you need to be circumcised, would that be an unprofitable word? Or a word that does not profit to no profit? Yeah, it would. So when he says strive not about words to no profit, the issue is not about the striving. It's about the no profit. That's the issue. And so there are words in the Bible that are not worth your effort to strive for because they're unprofitable. I'm not saying they should be excised from the scripture. I'm saying for people's elevation and growth. If you, if you try to communicate to people the law of God, they will learn the knowledge of their sin, hopefully, or else become self-righteous legalists. Right? And will they profit by the grace of God? Not by teaching the law. The grace of God isn't taught by the law. Right? So maybe you should teach the grace of God, which includes forgiveness and how to walk by the Spirit and how to reckon your old man dead and that sort of thing. Those are profitable words. What do I do with my sin? Well, condemn it under the law. That's not profitable. God's given you his grace today. Right. This is how Paul talks about corrupt words. Look at Titus 1 verse 9. See, I don't know, Justin. It seems like you're trying to pigeonhole it in your, in your hobby horse of a belief. Well, Let's find another place in Paul's epistles, the book of Titus, where he tells people to be quiet because of what they're teaching. I wonder what they're teaching. Titus 1, verse 9. He says, hold fast the faithful word. Apparently words matter. But what happens if people are trying not to uh, communicate the faithful word and are trying just to say, well, you know, truth evolves and we need to progress and doctrine needs to develop and things like this. And, and uh, here comes Titus and he says, oh, Paul told me to hold fast the faithful word. I'm going to hold fast what I was taught. Well, Titus, you're old-fashioned, you're a bigot, you know. Come on, just change with the times. Not, no one thinks that way anymore. Hold fast to faithful words. Apparently, words matter. Paul said, strive not about words, Titus. 
And Titus says, no, he says, strive not about words, no profit. <laughs> See, it matters how that verse is translated. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. That's teaching. For, why? Why is this important? Verse 10, for there are many, there are many, like right now at the time Titus lives, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers who are speaking words. And they're not wearing red capes and pitchforks and, you know, that's not it. These people are deceivers in which they're speaking what they say is truth. They're speaking what they say is righteousness. It's especially of the circumcision. We are God's people. We're preaching even Jesus. In verse 11, he says, whose mouths must be stopped. Women get in a tizzy over Paul telling some ladies to be quiet in 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. Paul tells a lot of people to be quiet, not just women. And here, he's telling these guys, shut their mouths. Good thing he didn't identify females there. He didn't tell, them, tell us if they're females or males, because if he did, there'd be a whole gender controversy, right? These people, because of what they're saying, need to shut their mouths. And that's, that's, by the way, the same reason why he tells anyone to be quiet in Scripture, because of what they're saying. That's wrong. That's why he tells them to be silent. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. I wonder how they can do that. Because what they teach is appealing, that's why. What they teach is attractive. Either to the flesh, uh, whether that be uh, to sin, or whether it be the flesh, righteousness. Either way, the flesh can be attracted by one or two of those things. And so that's 1, 9 through 11. Paul is saying, here's some hearers, whole houses, that are being subverted, right? They're following after wrong doctrine. So we need faithful workmen who can hold fast the faithful word to exhort and convince the gainsayers because they have subverted whole houses. You know what he's saying? Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 9. He says, this is a faithful saying. This is profitable. We covered this last week. I will thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable. These are profitable words. You believe in God, maintain good works. Verse 9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about what? The law. Like what law? Like man's law? Like Greek law? No, like the law of God. Strivings about God's law. 2 Timothy 2, he says, strive not about words to no profit. If verse 8 is profitable and verse 9 is not, what are words to no profit? Strivings about the law. Right. For they are unprofitable and vain. That's a bold saying, Paul. Didn't God on Mount Sinai with lightning and thunder carve into rock his laws? Yes. Don't his laws change the course of history and maintain perfect righteousness and make wise the simple? Yep, they sure do. And he says it's unprofitable and vain because of the grace of God that brings salvation today. If you try to communicate that as what God is doing right now. Right. As a result of this, in verse 10, he says, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. People want to take that word heretic and say, well, it really means someone who causes division. Don't argue about words. <laughs> That's why they want to go with it. They, they, they hate dividers. <laughs> they hate those who would be divisive. Which is why you'll see in verse 15, they do not translate it rightly divide because they can hint at a division. They don't want to say that. Heretic doesn't simply mean division. It means believing something wrong. You're causing a division by believing something wrong. It has to do with words. It's not simply one who makes its own group or something. He says a man is a heretic. He just got done talking about unprofitable words in verse 9. After the first and second admonition, which is you admonish them about their error. After the first and second admonition, he says, reject. Okay. Knowing that he that is such is subverted. That's why you reject them. You don't reject them because that's the rule. Sorry, can't come back for a third try. You reject them because they're subverted. Like if you're talking to someone and you're making progress, talk with them. But he says, if they're subverted, which is they, they're overturned, their faith is overthrown. They're now against what was once true. And there's no changing their mind. They're subverted. They're upside down. They're backward. Then they sin. It says they're subverted and sinneth, being condemned to themselves. When they boldly proclaim and preach the opposite of what is true, this is a problem. He says they're heretic, reject. You admonish, you, you love them, you try, but it's like that's, that's, no, when they're putting up their gates and their walls, that, that's what they're doing. Okay. But notice the word subversion there. Why are they subverted? Because of strivings about the law, contentions, and foolish questions. Right? Genealogies, things that the Bible contains. These are Bible issues, what I'm trying to point out here. 
Paul is admonishing the faithful workmen. Their faithfulness, the faithful word, the faithful service is a result of the gospel Paul was given, verse 8. That's why he's suffering and enduring things. That's why he was put in prison, because of what Christ appointed to him. And the unfaithful workman is going to look at the scripture and say, well, all scripture is profitable, so I'm going to grab from anywhere and not make any distinctions and make it mean anything I want to whomever I want. And they're going to subvert people's faith, overthrow people's faith. It's dangerous, at the very least, undermine God's purpose and his charge. It's a damaging work. And that's why Paul says it's a sin. Right? And so there are hearers that are subverted in Titus. Let's look at 1 Timothy. What are unprofitable words, I wonder? We were in 1 Timothy earlier, and we saw in verse 3 where he says, Charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And again, people read this without knowing how to rightly divide, and they say, well, no other doctrine. This means not Christianity, right? Not Bible. Well, keep reading. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister question. Where would one get genealogies? Maybe Scripture would have some? There are places outside of scriptures with, with fables, genealogies, but the Jews were known for adding fables. We see that in Titus to the Word of God. Jesus said that. Make the Word of God not effective your tradition. Right? But also genealogies. Um, does it matter where you come from genealogically in this dispensation? No. Did it matter before this dispensation? Yes. See, so there's a Word of God where it does matter. But he says, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, What's godly edifying? What's godliness? Godliness is going to be according to truth. Godliness is the knowledge, pursuit, and living by the truth that God has revealed to you about what he's doing. You can't be godly without knowing God's will. You can't be godly without desiring God's will. You can't be godly without doing God's will. So he says, rather than godly edify, which is in the faith so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, swerved from faith unfeigned, have turned aside into vain jangling. So they were doing something godly and profitable. And the opposite of profitable is vain, without profit. And now they swerve to vanity. I'm like, the car is off the road. And what is this vanity? Or vain jangling is what he says. Verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law. There it is. Again. We have a pretty good definition here for what these strivings to know profit are. It's in the Bible. Not being able to understand who's the God speaking to or what he's doing now. Thinking that everything just goes together. There's no reason to make distinctions. And he says, you're destroying people by this. It's causing error. You're going around in circles because you're saying, well, it's faith, right? Just faith in Christ. Oh, well, faith plus works. Without works is dead. So it's faith plus works. Well, it's faith only. Without You're going back in circles, back and forth. This is subverting people's faith. They don't know what to believe. Well, so do I have to do the law? Well, the law is good. You should do it. I thought I wasn't under the law. Well, you're not. You're at liberty. Well, it's going back and forth. And so you're subverting people. Striving about words to no profit. If you'd be able to rightly divide things, you'd understand how there is profit to the whole Bible. Right? But 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, There are those that desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor have they affirmed. They don't know what they're doing. Unfaithful workmen. Okay? So what were the unprofitable words of 1 Timothy 1? teachers of the law. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 19. He says, this charge I committed to thee, son Timothy. And then he says, uh, hold the faith in a, in a good conscience, in verse 19, which some having put away, that is the faith, and a good conscience, concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Now how does a ship get shipwreck? It gets overturned, overthrown. Right? It gets subverted. Verse 20, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander? whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. They, are, they were speaking truth, and now they're speaking error. Right? So they, they are made shipwreck of people's faith. Look at 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 8. The Spirit speaks expressly, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith. That's the, the body of doctrine, the body of words. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, this, this book represents my faith. Generally, yes. Which parts? Because right, it's a big book. As he says, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Oh, yeah, we should avoid devils and seducing spirits, definitely. Only the Holy Spirit inspired King James for me. Verse 2 says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I'm going to have a soft 
conscience. I'm not going to be hypocritical. I'm going to do what I say and what God says to do, I'm going to do. Okay, that's a good intent. Verse 3 says, forbidding to marry. It gives you the doctrines and commanding to abstain from meats. And these are doctrines you find in the Bible that God instructed certain people. So what Paul calls doctrines of devils are actually doctrines found in the Scripture under the law. Certain people were forbidden to marry. Certain people were commanded to abstain from meats, which God hath now created, hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. The truth of what? The law? You wouldn't learn this by the law. You learn this truth by the revelation of the mystery and gospel grace of God. So there's a need to know which words profit and which words are devilish. God wrote those words. Yes, this is the word of God. But if you're convinced or deceived that what God is doing now is what he was doing before, that's the devilish lie. It's not that God's word to be ripped up and burned. You read it as it is in its context. That's what God told Israel to do. Now you can profit from it. But when you say, God's telling me to do that, and that's not what God said to do, suddenly it's a lie. That's exactly how the devil tempted Jesus, you know. He quoted scripture to him out of context. And Jesus called him on it every time. Like, was it wrong that Jesus be given the kingdoms of this world? Not at all. He's like, that's what he was destined for. It's the wrong time, right? The devil quotes scripture. He quotes scripture back in context. See, that, that was what Jesus' response was to the temptations of the devil. Paul says, it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. So words matter, warnings matter about doctrines that God is no longer saying are instructions to you. We profit from all the Bible when you read it in its context, to whom he was speaking. And so unprofitable words are throughout this book. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Till I come, he says to Timothy, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Apparently words matter. Paul telling someone just to read, 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 and doctrine, 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 that's just going to make him fight about words. Well, the verse didn't say don't fight about words. It says strive not about words, no profit, which means you need to have the discernment, the sharpening skills to know which words are profitable, which are not. So you need to read. You need to study doctrine. Right? You see, that, that's two totally different paths based on how you translate that verse. If it's not about words because words don't matter, then what does matter if the words don't matter? Maybe how you live would matter, Right? I mean, it's not the words that we're supposed to fight over. What are we fighting over then? Loving one another? That's what we stand for. That's what we strive for. Loving one another. They'll know us by our love. Right? Maybe it's our, how, hard, how much hard work we put in. Maybe doing the best we can. Right? Maybe that's the type of thing we should strive for. Like an athlete, doing the best they can. That's what we do. Well, that's not what Paul said. Verse 24 and verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, what? Taking heed to the doctrine and thyself. Thou shalt both say thyself and them that hear thee, because you're speaking words at them. Because you're, you take heed to the doctrine, you'll know what the profitable words are, you'll speak those profitable words, and you'll save yourself and others. Right? You see, the emphasis here isn't just on words, period. It's on good words, profitable words, the right words, the words that God told us to, 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 to follow the instructions of. His will for today. All the word of God is, is profitable, and all of it is God's revelation and his wisdom to whom he said it. Right? We need to find our instructions. This is all in verse 14. Not even in verse 15 yet. People like the bookmark verse, verse 15. We're not even there yet. Verse 14 tells you about striving not to words with no, uh, to no profit. Okay. 1 Timothy 6. Verse 1, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Apparently God has a doctrine about counting masters worthy of honor. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service. So either way, whether they believe or don't believe, serve who you're supposed to serve. Honor to honors do, right? That's the idea. Because, because they are faithful, serve them even more. Because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. Now, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evils, and rivings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. He just went off the edge there, didn't he? He wasn't like, if you disagree with me, then, you know, 
you really need to compromise. Because if you disagree with what I just said, which are the wholesome words of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are perverted, corrupt, striking about words, and making no profit to anybody. You want to know what the striving about words no profit are? There's a good <laughs> example right there. Not consenting to the wholesome words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, people who fail to write the divine say, well, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John right there. Jesus Christ gave words to the Apostle Paul, who just wrote them down. Paul says on 1 Corinthians 14, the commandments I give unto you acknowledge that they're of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Christ revealed the mystery. And that's what he's explaining to Timothy here, how to operate accordingly. And he calls it pervert and corrupt if you do not consent to that. You see, So it matters which words. Wow. He says godliness with, he says they suppose that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You see a, a consistent pattern here where Paul identifies unprofitable words or strivings of words about no profit, strivings under the law, things like this. He says withdraw yourself, avoid them, reject them. Like it's constantly the separation that Paul's setting up, right? You either speak the words of truth that Christ gave to me or you're a heretic. I mean, he's drawing a pretty firm line there. It's not just like, oh, well, he's just a Christian doesn't know any better. Paul says, if they're going to stick with that, you separate. By the way, that's why we're here, like here. Right? I mean, there are lots of other churches in town that fail to rightly divide, do not consent to Paul's special apostleship or his appointment from the Lord Jesus Christ. And his instructions are, if they don't do that, they're preaching and teaching unprofitable things and strivings that will subvert people, the hearers. You shouldn't be a part of that, right? That's what he says. Speak pure words, uncorrupt words, unperverted words, rightly divided words. This is what he's going to say. In 1 Corinthians 13, 3, he says, if you can't speak profitable words, be quiet. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 3, he talks about tongue talking. And he says, if I speak with tongues and things like this, if I give my body to be burned and I have not charity, what's he say? It profits me nothing. Paul's talking about striving about words to so no profit. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass. There's no profit to this. Chapter 14, he talks about it as well. It's not about simply speaking words that don't profit anybody. Example, tongue talking in a language nobody knows. Paul says that very frankly. If it does not profit, then why are you doing it? First Corinthians 14, verse 5. Doing it for God. God wants you to profit the hearer. That's what he said over and over again. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesied than he that spoke with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge, or by prophesying or by doctrine? He says, if I, even if I'm speaking in tongues and giving you the scores to the latest football game, that doesn't profit you. I've got to speak to you doctrine, like truth. Right? Tongues is just like the means to speak to people who don't speak the same language. That's all that it is. Here, supernaturally given by God. Okay. He says down in verse 12 of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, even, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church, which is to the profit of the church. If you can't profit the church, can't profit each other, then what are you saying? And that's what he's communicating. That's what he's teaching. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 19, Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also, which is a profitable thing, right? Then 10,000 words in an unknown tongue, which is not profitable to any hearer. Strive not about words to no profit, but the subverting of the hearers. That's a pretty good charge. There's a lot included in this. You've got to know the right doctrine, who you got the doctrine from, you know, which words of Christ are you talking about, how you communicate it, there's a lot in that. Verse 28, Paul says, If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Everyone goes, oh, He's against people. No, he's not against people. He says, If you don't speak the right words, be quiet. In this same section, he tells women to be quiet. I wonder why. It's not because all women speak wrong words. It's that those women were speaking some wrong words. He says, You need to be quiet. He tells them earlier, one at a time. If you don't get your time, then you don't get your time. It's like we're speaking to profit here. That's what we're doing. Which means you've got to know the truth. So if you don't know the truth, then you need to be quiet. 
That's what he just said. If you can't speak to edify. In 1 Corinthians 14, down in verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Paul's very clear about this in his epistles. The instruction then, look at Ephesians 4. The instruction is to be strong in and to minister the words of grace. That was the 2 Timothy 2 verse 1. Be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That's the instruction. And Ephesians 4 puts this pretty clearly as well. I'm trying to show you that this teaching and instruction is throughout his epistles. The importance of words and avoiding unprofitable ones. Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now what's 2 Timothy 2.14 talking about? I charge you, strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. What ought you do then? You should minister grace unto the hearers. Well, it's like being polite. No, grace, like the doctrine, like grace doctrine. He just talked about in Ephesians 3, the dispensation of the grace of God. Have you heard? Minister grace unto the hearers. What well, about the law? He already talked about that, right? Not, that's not how you minister. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Why? Because if you're saying things corrupt and unprofitable, you're grieving the Holy Spirit, who desires to minister and edify and profit the church. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, these are all coming out of your mouth, be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another. That's what comes out of your mouth. Tenderhearted comes out of your mouth. Forgiving one another comes out of your mouth. There's profitable words in verse 32. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So see, he's identifying profitable words and unprofitable. The only way you can do verse 32 there is if you know God's grace. That's profitable. You know what would be unprofitable? Holding someone to the law at that situation. Well, the law says condemn, condemn, condemn. Uh, Christ forgave you. That's grace doctrine. That's profitable. Right? So the instruction is to be strong in God's grace and to minister the words of God's grace. That's what he's saying. Let's go back to 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. This is the first time he said this. Like many things in 2 Timothy, He's simply tying up the loose ends. He's, he's, he's recalling back. This is like Paul's greatest hit, 2 Timothy. <laughs> he goes back. Remember what I wrote to you in all these other epistles? These 12 other epistles? I'm giving you this charge, Timothy. Strive not about words no profit. He says, tell them, charge them. To strive not about words no profit, but it's the serving of the hearers. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Strive, study. Both of them take effort. Right? One of them is not considering the words. One is. You see how he's contrasting that? The charge is, strive not about words to no profit. Hell, you don't care what the words are you're saying. The other one is study, which means you're going to care about the words. Amen. Right? That's the difference there. That's why those words are important. If you take out the word study, and take out the word strive, you miss the connection. You miss it. First of all, we, they already said, don't fight about words. Well, how's that connected to verse 15? Verse 15, the word study is removed. Instead, it's replaced with do your best. Be diligent to present yourself. Make an effort. I love that one. Make an effort. It wasn't even like make the best effort. It's like make an effort. <laughs> That's like D student, right? Just make an effort. Make an effort. Work hard. Do all you can. Like there's actually a translation that says work hard. Do all you can. Now, all of these replacements, <laughs> the word study is the right word, by the way. People will point out, well, they didn't have books. People were illiterate back then. People were illiterate 150 years ago. People are illiterate today. Okay. But, you know, Solomon talks about studying books. The word study is not something forbidden from their vocabulary just because people were illiterate. Some people were. Not everyone was. And God gave words and wrote it in a book. And he's talking to Timothy, who has it and help Paul write them. So study is appropriate. But even then, it doesn't even have to require that he's saying, go to the library 24 hours a day. That's not what he's saying. He's talk the reason why study is the best word there is because it refers to what your mind knows and recalls. It, it's, you're using your mind about words. Working hard, doing your best, being diligent. Does this require words at all? No, it doesn't. 
The emphasis on these things, make an effort, do all you can, puts the focus on the deed, the work, without any emphasis on words. Because we just read in verse 14 in the same translations, fighting about words is useless. So do what you can. Make an effort. Work hard. What about words? Don't fight about words. What about this doctrine? Be quiet, you're fighting about words. Right? Well, the doctrines are different. Fighting about words. The Bibles are different. Fighting about words. You see how this can really silence people who care about words. Just do the best you can, work hard, make an effort to feel yourself approved of the God. That's not how I know I'm approved of the God, by how hard I work. Okay. So, it's interesting. One translation even says they insert, I think it was the Living Bible, which isn't really a translation. Um, literally, it's not a translation, it's a paraphrase. It's a, someone wrote what they wanted to write. They actually put Matthew 25 into this verse, in verse 15. You say, uh, it, says, it says something like, work hard, uh, and then it says that you may hear, well done, which is Matthew 25, 21, in the parable of the talents, you know, where the faithful servants and all that. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So the insert in verse 15, work hard so you can hear, well done. Like, what? Uh, you just put Matthew 25 right in 2 Timothy. And Paul's not even talking about you working hard. He's talking about profitable words. And so we need to understand Paul's emphasis here. Study to show thyself approved unto God. What's it mean to show? To show means to make known. To show thyself approved unto God. People read this wrongly as if it's saying you need to study or else you're not approved by God. That's not what it says. Paul's not talking about how to get saved here. How are you approved by God? Ephesians 1 verse 6 tells you something about that. Ephesians 1 verse 6 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, not by what you've done, but what he's done, his grace, wherein he hath made us, he made us accepted in the beloved. That's Jesus Christ. We're approved, we're accepted because we're in Christ. We, we got there by his grace. We trusted the gospel of his grace. So how are you approved? By God's grace in Christ Jesus and the beloved? That's how you were approved. Well, the verse says study to make yourself approved. No, it says study to show thyself approved. That's different. You are approved already. Do you understand? So if you are approved by God, you are an ambassador, you're already a minister, you are a steward. That's what you are. Just like Romans 6 says, you are dead with Christ. Maybe you ought to reckon yourself dead. Right? You are approved unto God. Maybe you should study to show thyself approved unto God. Hmm? That's what he's saying. You're already approved. He's not saying you have, you're going to be approved or somehow you're going to work, work, work so that God can approve you. You're already approved. We're talking about faithful workmanship in the here and now. We covered that last week, right? He's talking about right now, like how you work now and serve. Study the show that's self approved unto God. Don't strive about words to no profit. So you're approved by Christ that way. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 17. How are we approved? Is it by our hard work, our being diligent, our doing all we can, putting in our best effort? No, just making an effort, excuse me. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 17. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Doesn't seem like there's anything you can do to make yourself approved unto God. Right? And what can you do that God says, yep, good work, you're approved by him? That's not a thing. He judges your, the sort of work you do. The work can be approved or not. But he says, study to show thyself approved. So again, this is the admonition that you are already approved. Study instead of striving about unprofitable words. Show thyself. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. The way you show thyself approved unto God is by what you make known. And what you make known is determined by how you study the word of truth. You understand? Or how you rightly divide. Or how you discern what is profitable and not profitable in words. If you are striving about words to no profit, then even though you're approved unto God, you're not making it known that you are because you look like you're really damaging people by what you're saying. You may have good intentions. You are desiring to be a teacher of the law, but you're totally missing God's grace. If you are indeed saved by God's grace, would be a question if you're teaching the law. But if that's the case, you're desiring to be a teacher of the law, you are pursuing vain jangling. 
How would someone know who the approved of God are by God's grace? You say, you can't, not by their works. You're right. But if they're seeing you saved by God's grace and you're living in sin, you're communicating error, and it's like, yeah, you're no better than a devil. It's like, that's how you're, that's what's going on. You're not helpful at all. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul says, For pray for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That I may make known the mystery of the gospel. That's why he suffers, why he endures, and that is how he shows himself approved unto God. I was saved by the gospel grace of God. I'm a member of the fellowship of his body, which was a mystery. And that's what I'm communicating and preaching. And that's why he's in bonds. And that's how I show myself approved. Let me say it a different way. You can be saved by God's grace by trusting his finished work, his death, and resurrection, and not know that you're approved by God. Like you couldn't, you're like, oh, I trust his finished work. But you don't know the riches you've got in Christ and the spiritual riches. So how do you show thyself approved? By communicating that which made you approved, God's grace, Jesus Christ. And that's going to come as a result of you learning it first. Study. Right? So why do we study? To show ourselves approved unto God. So that when we communicate words, we minister grace to the hearers and profitable things to the hearers. And we don't make people stumble or stunt their growth or be an obstacle to them or damn people's souls. Because that can happen. People who are saved by God's grace, and only God knows, but I'm sure this is the thing. You're saved by God's grace, and you start teaching the law. And people are hearing your law teaching, or accepting Jesus into your, into your life, or, or receiving him into your heart. And it's like, that's not the gospel at all. Those, those are unprofitable words. And you in your heart of hearts know what the gospel of grace of God is, but you're not communicating it. You're not faithful to speak it clearly. You're not bold to speak it clearly, perhaps. So you see all this is included in there. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 and 2, Paul says that he's a steward of the mysteries. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. How do you know if someone's minister, a minister of Christ? We read in the scripture that everyone who's saved by God's grace is made a member of his body and therefore is a minister. But how do you know if someone's acting as one? Only if they're showing that's all they communicate, right? If someone says they're saved by Christ and they're ministering the law to somebody, they're not ministering Christ, are they? But Paul says, as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. If you're not faithful to that which you've been given, got the gospel, his word, the gospel, the grace of God, then you're going to be subverting the hearers. Okay. Not only is it your own misunderstanding that's going to be a problem for yourself, but other people are going to be affected by your own lack of communication of truth. Right? That's what Paul's saying here to Timothy, a faithful workman. You want to be a faithful man who, who is able to teach others also? you got to know and know how to teach others also, which means you got to know how to say it, which is a good, way, good reason to say it. Have your Bible studies and teachers and conversations and minister and evangelize so that you can communicate it and learn for yourself so that others can know. All right. You say, well, I can still be saved by God's grace and not do any of this. You're right, and you would not be a faithful workman. That's always been the condition in 2 Timothy. The assumption is Timothy is a faithful workman. And the instruction is to teach others also. If that's not where you're at, then 2 Timothy's not for you, apparently. Right? But that is the will of God for each of us. So Paul says, to show thyself approved as a steward of the mysteries of God, as a faithful workman. Right? Now, 1 Corinthians 4, we were just there. In verse 3... What's Paul say? But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. He that judgeth me is the Lord. So he just said, it's required a man to be found faithful. And who holds that man accountable for the faithfulness? The brothers and sisters of Christ, hopefully, you know, encourage you, but no one judges that person but God. Which is why this, the person saved by grace, who is given the title of minister of Christ, which is all everyone saved by grace, can claim, well, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do because I answered to the Lord, and that would be true. But that's going to be some day to answer to the Lord in your laziness and your lack of care and concern and gratitude and faithfulness. Well, do I lose any glory? You get that freely by God's grace. 
But the thought of squeaking by is not glorious. The thought of, I'm going to squeak every last evil out I can out of this world before I leave, is not glorious. It's shameful. But he says, I'm not judged by any man. The Lord judges me. Which is why in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, he says, Study the show thyself approved unto God, not men. Right? It's not by men that we get judged. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 5, he'll go on to say, They shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables, itching ears, they'll heap themselves teachers. He exhorts T Timothy by the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the judge, not men. And so, study to show yourself approved unto God is the instruction uh, in case you're worried about pleasing men and what they would have you do. They're not the determiner of your workmanship, but God is, which should be a higher standard. He says, show thyself approved unto God, a workman, that needeth not to be ashamed, a workman. That is the key part of the verse there. There is work that needs to be done. Which is why you see the other translations make the first part, work hard, do the best you can. But without the right words, your workmanship is in vain. Which is why it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. That's why it has that order there. Without the words, your work is in vain. Just doing something without the right direction, without the knowledge and, and knowing God's will is going to be harmful. So it's not true when it comes to ministering of God's word to, if you don't know what to do, just do something. Please don't. Right? First, know God's will. Know what he's doing. Know the right words. Then ponder about what you can do. At that point, when you, when you know the words of faith and the good conscience and all that, then you're like, well, I don't know what to do with these words. Well, then you talk about that. Well, I don't know. You can do lots of things, you know. Tracks, hand out, preach, teach, words, Bible, books, you know, lots of things you can do, conversations, Bible study. You can talk about that. But you've got to have the right words first. The workman here, that need not to be ashamed, the faithful workman who's studied, is described in verses 3 through 6. We saw those, those descriptions. It's patterned by Paul in verses 7 through 10. The principles of the faithful man is in verse 11 through 13. And we see the charge in verse 14. The strive not about worse and no profit. This workman needeth not to be ashamed because he, he knows, he's bold because he knows that the power, he knows the power, love, and mind of Christ. That's why he's not ashamed. We cover back in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, when he was talking about Timothy and spirit of fear, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind, right? And he goes on to say, be not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor me as prisoner. We partake of the afflictions of the gospel. So the unashamed workman in Chapter 2, verse 15, is the one who knows the power, love, and a sound mind. If you know the power of Christ, which is in the gospel of Christ, if you know the love of Christ, which makes not a shame because you have the Holy Spirit in you, Romans 5, you're in him. If you know the mind of Christ, which the Corinthians had problems with, but if you know the power of Christ, the love of Christ, the mind of Christ, the will of Christ, right, then you are not ashamed. You can do the work. When you're trying to do the work and you do not know the mind of Christ, you're going to have a problem. If you're doing the work and don't know the power of Christ, which is the gospel, not your own effort, you're going to have a problem. You see the issue there? So the unashamed workman needs to study the faithful sayings Paul just charged them with, to hear them. You know, you can study things without even opening a book, you understand. You can study things. You heard things. You can study them. Right? Hearing the words of God. Now, he gave us a book to study. That's so why we study it. Verse 15 ends with, Needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This rightly dividing the word of truth we'll pick up next week as well. We'll just begin tonight. It's a catchword for many people. Are you a right divider? Do you rightly divine? Yes, I do. Oh, great, brother. Well, it's, it's like saying, do you love God? I sure do. Do you do as well? Yep. Do you know the gospel? Yep. You can't stop the conversation there. Do you know the gospel? Yeah. What is it? Do you know God? Yep. Who is he, the God that you know? Do you serve the Lord? How? Like there's follow-up questions to these things. So do you rightly divide? Yes. There should be a follow-up question. How? What does that mean to you? The scripture instructs very clearly to rightly divide a word of truth, unless you have other Bibles, of course. They'll take out the rightly dividing part, change it with something else. But my point here is that it's a catchword for many people. Baptists use it. Evangelicals use it. Reformed use it. 
Awana uses it. Right, the right word of truth. Catholics use it. You know, it's in the Bible. Catholics use it. The witnesses use it. Heretics use it. <laughs> what am I saying? Just because you see someone who claims to write the right word of truth, don't assume what that means to them. It could be something very different. But the instruction is true. We need to rightly divide the word of truth, as opposed to striving about words to no profit. Those two go together. Okay. Rightly, in other Bible versions, they change the, 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 the saying here. In the ESV, instead of rightly dividing, it's rightly handling the word of truth. In the, the Phillips, it's who knows how to use the word of truth to the best advantage. And uh, the New Living Translation says, who correctly explains the word of truth. The Amplified says, who accurately handles and skillfully teaches the word of truth. Like, well, isn't that kind of the same ballpark on that? Well, there's a specific difference that matters here. I mean, is it good to accurately handle and skillfully teach? Yes, it is. Is it good to correctly handle? Yeah. He, he talked about not handling the Word of God deceitfully in 2 Corinthians 4. But there's a benefit to it saying rightly dividing. And it's not simply because it's a slogan. That's, but that's meaningless. It's that there's something to the words rightly and dividing. Rightly is better than correctly or skillfully because it turns upright what was subverted in verse 14. Do you get it? If you strive about words to no profit, what happens to the hearers? They're turned upside down. What's he tell them to do? Make it right. Flip it over. Right? Make sure it's right, upright. If you make it skillful or correcting, then now you've lost that. Something is subverted, and now we're just explaining about that. What? No, no, we need, to, we need to make it up right, rightly. Make it right, not subverted, turn it over, turn it over, overthrow it. So rightly is better there, just in English. I underlined that word, the vert part of subvert, because again, that vert, this, this is the vertical line. You subvert something when the ship goes under the water, right? And then you're supposed to right the ship, <laughs> put it up above again. Rightly, that's how you're supposed to do that. So it's it's a, it's an appropriate word. Dividing is also an appropriate word. Now, people who do not like division hate the word because they think it's going to cause people to separate, which is odd because even though those who rightly divide are often associated with the doctrine of separation as well, Paul's not talking about the doctrine of separation here, which is the idea of avoiding certain people based on different wrong doctrines, things like that. He's not simply talking about that. He's talking about the word of truth. Okay. But people don't like the word division. It's like a, it's like a curse word in postmodern Christianity. It's, uh, if you cause any sort of separation from any other person that names Jesus, you're a pro uh, troublemaker. And that's just unbiblical. Okay? Uh, there are wrong teachers, false teachers, people who have it wrong. There are people who, who do things wrongly, unbiblically, and we ought to separate from them. That's another teaching. But that's not based on this word dividing here. Okay. Dividing is better than the word teaching or interpreting or handling or explaining or using the word of truth because dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth, speaks to dissecting parts. The Greek or the Demeo, which everyone tries to explain in their own way, is rightly dividing. That's what it says. It's to cut straight, to sharply, straightly cut, like dissecting, like that type of Thing. And you would dissect not just for the fun of it, you're dissecting carefully and rightly and straightly because you understand that there's different parts and you can't mix them together, right? That's why you do it. You ever see someone cut a cake, right? It's rare you see the person just go, ah, and start you know, chopping like that. Yeah, they're cutting it up. But usually it's like, all right, let's get, let's get that eighth piece right there because there's eight people. We're going to, there we go, 30 degrees, you know. They get it just right. Why? Because there's so many people. You've got to have equal parts. You can't have this huge piece for one guy and a little tiny piece for another. It's equal parts. Right? So they're doing that real carefully. That's this idea of rightly dividing. You know there's parts. You know the parts are specifically distinct and they have a certain thing assigned to them. And they need to be rightly divided. Now, what is it that's being rightly divided in the verse? Word. Words. In contrast to verse 14, driving about words to no profit. Right? That would be just chopping the cake any which way, and you get a mashy mess of icing and crumbles. Didn't do something right there. There's no profit. 
fact, no one's ever coming back for cake at your restaurant. Subverting the, the patrons there, okay? Taking an analogy too far. Speaking to dissecting parts and purpose, because it's necessary, the Bible can subvert people. You understand? We've already dealt with before, there are words that don't profit that are used from the Bible. So when it says rightly using the, the word of truth, or correctly using the word of truth, or explaining the word of truth, that doesn't go as much as to say rightly dividing the word of truth, which identifies distinctions and parts in the Bible itself. This isn't simply taking away the errors in the world from God's Bible. This is people who use God's words from the Bible wrongly. Well, how do you know if they're using them wrongly? How do you know if that part is not something that's for you? Well, this, is, this is what we mean by rightly dividing the word of truth. This is why you need four, verse 14. That's what I was telling you before. You need verse 14 to explain this. 15 by itself, it's hard just to read that word, that phrase by itself, say, oh, I know exactly what that's talking about. Verse 14 is telling you the opposite, right? Unprofitable words. We saw a lot of cross references there for the law and everything else. And now the positive charge is rightly divided. That, that's the profitable use of the word, is to rightly divide it. Okay? And so the Bible can subvert. It's not really teaching, interpreting, handling, or explaining. It's, it's how to do those things. Like, how do you study? How do you do this? We need to rightly divide. There's, there's parts that need to be dissected. You need to pay attention and focus. Study, right? There's words that don't profit and profit. You need to know what God said to who, because God in Christ appointed Paul with this gospel to Gentiles, and over here he spoke to Moses, and Moses isn't what God's doing now. And if you don't discern that, you don't divide that, which is the right division, then you're kind of causing a mess, an unprofitable nature, subverting people's faith, or throwing, making shipwreck. Hebrews 1, verse 1, is an excellent verse that gives an instruction about the need. Now, I'm, talk, I'm not saying here Paul wrote Hebrews in like this, but you can learn this idea of rightly dividing the truth from lots of places in the Bible, not just in Paul. Let me say it a different way. Rightly dividing the word of truth is not a unique teaching to Paul, although you need to rightly divide prophecy from mystery. That's clear. But you can understand this principle from the Old Testament as well. Because there's a time when Abraham was alive who was not under the law. Then there's a time the law was given. Right? You can rightly divide Old Testament from New Testament in Israel's prophetic program. You need to do that. You can't blend them all together. There's a time for these things. In Hebrews 1, verse 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. God speaks at sundry times and in diverse manners. Hebrews is going to go on to explain that when he speaks in, di in sundry times and diverse manners, he doesn't always speak the same thing, like Hebrews does. Hebrews does not include the revelation of the mystery. But it's talking about Old Testament, New Testament, Israel's past and future, and it's talking about things are changing here, and you've got to understand the difference. It even talks about when they happen, when it happens that they change. Hebrews 8 says one's decaying and falling away, and the other one's coming. You know. And you can't have a testament of force till after the death of the testator, Hebrews 9, verse 17. Like it's telling, well, what about before Christ died? Can you have a New Testament then? Paul, Hebrews says, not Paul, Hebrews says, no, you cannot. Right? So there's this, look, there's things in the Bible that are appropriate for a certain time or a certain people or a certain context that you need to distinguish from others. Divide is the right word. Use doesn't give that instruction. Use it? Lots of people can use it. Well, make sure you use it right. Well, how, how, how do you do that? Rightly divide because there's parts that need to be, I'm doing an autopsy. Right? Make sure you use your autopsy tools right. Does that tell you anything about how to do it? No. Thanks for the advice. Make sure you rightly divide that body. You mean there's different parts to this thing? Yes. You see, it instructs something there. To divide. That means there's more than one part, and if you just start slopping around your knife there, you're going to mess things up. Make sure you use your tools right. Make sure you explain things. How do I approach and perform, rightly divide. Okay, understand the parts. Hebrews 4, verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword. What's this two-edged sword doing? What's this sh thing sharper than a sword? I mean, a sword is a, 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 a hefty weapon, but it's not good for surgery, right? Verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. There is a division between soul and spirit. Wouldn't that be a right division? If you don't make that division, what are you doing? Or the joints and the marrow. Yeah, there's no difference. Joints, marrow, it's all the same. <laughs> there's a difference. It, and it can do that. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Thoughts and intents doesn't matter. Apparently, the verse says it does, and the Word of God can, is so sharp, it can discern the difference. Which means if you have the Word of God in you, all Scripture is profitable, and you use it to rightly divide the Word of truth, you can start discerning these things. Yes? Flesh, spirit. Paul talked about flesh and spirit a lot in his epistles. What does that mean? What is the spirit? What is my spirit? What is that? What's my old man, my new man? Well, that seems like a discernment you need to know. A right division. You need to understand. Plus prophecy and mystery. That's a right division. You need to understand. You've got to discern that. There's got to be a, a, a line cut there, right? Past, future, but now. All these things have to be distinguished. Ephesians 2.11, where Paul says, In time past we were called uncircumcision, is divided from two verses later when he says, But now you are in Christ Jesus. There's no circumcision on circumcision. The old is divided from the new in Ephesians 2.15, uh, two verses later, when he says, Of twain he made one new man. So there's the old and the new. Separated. Divided. You're hearing words. You're profiting and learning from them about making a division in the Scripture. And so when you communicate to other people about how to be to trust the faithfulness of Christ and, and, and be faithful to the Word of God, you're communicating these divisions. Okay? If you don't know how to do that, you're not rightly dividing. Right? It's a skill that has to be learned. It's not one day you're like, yep, got it. Romans 3.21, But now the righteousness of God without the laws may manifest. But now, like it wasn't before then, it wasn't before then. Got to be a division there. Romans 10.4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. We mean there was a time where it was for righteous? Apparently, because Christ is the end of it. Galatians 3.25, now the schoolmaster has come. We're not, no longer in need of a schoolmaster. Now that faith has come. Galatians 6.15, circumcision or uncircumcision profits anything, avails anything, but a new creature. Right? There's a right division there. Galatians 2.17, those things are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. A division is made there. We've already talked about Hebrews. And so, rightly dividing is the right terminology. Rightly dividing the word of truth is what you're dividing. It's not dividing God's words from, again, the pagan religions. It's the word of truth. All the Bible is true. And by that, we don't mean what the devil said was true in the Scripture. We're talking about God's word and God inspired the words. So everything in here is of him. So it's a true account of what the devil said. It's a true account of sin. Everything is true. That God inspired here. What a truth. We need to rightly divide it. If we don't rightly divide it, then based on what we've learned in verse 14 and verse 15, if we don't rightly divide the word of truth, then the word of truth becomes unprofitable. Right? I mean, it's still the word of truth. That's why people claim to preach it. But if you don't rightly divide it, it becomes unprofitable. And therefore, you're striving, putting the effort in, you're working toward words to no profit. Has that happened before in Christianity? People minister, minister, want words to get out there, want to preach a message, and it's to no profit. It subverts the hearers. It confuses. It stunts their growth. It hides the gospel. This is damaging because they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? This is the context. 2 Timothy 2.16, we'll cover some next week. We know it's talking about God's words needing rightly divided because in verse 16, the subject of the vein of profane babblings in verse 18 is resurrection. It says they teach the resurrection is past. Like resurrection is a biblical truth. It, it's true. And they're getting it in the wrong time. Thus subverting hearers, corrupting the hearers. And Paul says, see, they're teaching resurrection wrong. Don't argue about words, Paul. No, he's rightly divine the word of truth. And these people are subverting hearers. And he names them, by the way. So the context, strive not about words to no profit, or study, rightly dividing the word. That's the contrast. Profitable words come from rightly dividing the word of truth. Failing to rightly divide means you're striving about words to no profit. 
That's what, it, that's what that is. Okay. You're wrongly dividing, obviously, but what's that mean? You're not profiting anybody. You're subverting people, even though you're communicating words, words that Jesus said, but not through the Apostle Paul in another dispensation. Words that God said to Moses, not through to us today. That he talked about to Israel, not about the body of Christ. You need all scripture in its context is profitable. Not in its context. It's dangerous. All right? Amen. Any questions and comments about?